It is uh, always a joy and a privilege to gather with this church to worship together um, and have the opportunity to share from God's word with you. Uh, I was just considering as we were singing um, the, the encouragement that we get when we get to gather together and worship the Lord in song and to hear one another sing. Um, as we raise our voices up and share the truths together and go, okay, they believe that too. Amen. And it stirs our hearts to, uh, to be encouraged to go, I I'm not alone in this. Um, so as we hear each other say, it's not always pretty, <laughs> uh, but it, it, it's beautiful. It is because it, it encourages us. So I, I have uh, already uh, benefited from my time here with you. So I thank you for that and glad to be able to share God's word. I'm going to invite you to open up to the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 7. Gospel of Matthew chapter 7. Uh, we're going to look at the first six verses of chapter 7. The Lord Jesus is teaching. In Matthew 7, he says these words. Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck? that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye. Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give to dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. May the Lord bless the reading and preaching of his word. 
Uh, here in chapter 7 of Matthew's Gospel, we are uh, coming to the final section of Jesus' uh, teaching, which is known as the Sermon on the Mount, uh, maybe the most famous of all sermons. And, and throughout this teaching, the Lord Jesus, um, he is explaining the ethics of living in the kingdom of God. He is expounding what it means to be a true follower of his. Those who want to, to come to know him, love him, and live for him will live lives that are transformed by the realities of what it means to know, love, and follow Jesus. When we come to know Jesus as our Savior, understand Him as our Lord, and grow in a love for Him, that has implications for how we live our lives. It creates an ethic for us in our lives. And throughout this sermon, Jesus has, has been sort of drawing a line in the sand, if you will, to understand what it means to live as one of His followers. What it means to live in the kingdom of God. And throughout this sermon, he has given many challenging words. Difficult things for these hearers to understand. If you recall, at the beginning of this sermon, Matthew records for us that his disciples and many others have come to follow Jesus. And Jesus wants to lay down what it means to be an authentic, true disciple of his. There will be many who will hear this message from Jesus, sit at this message, and turn away because the words are too difficult. But the true disciple will hear these words, take them to heart, and and discover what does it mean to walk in obedience to these. Because the true disciple of Jesus is, is one who's committed to a life of transformation. Right? The Christian is not perfect. But God is committed to perfecting us. To transforming us. The Christian life is a life of transformation. And Jesus is giving a number of lessons about what that looks like. What is that ethic? And for our focus this morning, these six verses at the beginning of chapter 7, he wants to teach us the responsibility about judging, judging others. The title of this sermon is The Christian Responsibility of Righteous Judgment. What does it mean for the authentic follower of Jesus to righteously judge. Our main point this morning is that we as Christians, true disciples of Jesus, we have a responsibility to judge rightly because we live our lives for the one righteous judge. God our Father is the one righteous judge and we as his children must then be like he is. And so we, we have our question this morning. What, what, is, what does this text mean? And how does it make a difference in our lives of transformation? Jesus is teaching clearly that we are to judge not. He says it right in verse 1 of our text. Judge not lest you be judged. Right? And this right here might be the most popular Bible verse outside the church. <laughs> this is the Bible verse that the non-church culture loves, right? Whenever the church, whenever Christians want to make statements of truth, to divide right and wrong, the culture's like, I know a Bible verse. Judge not. Right? Hey, you're not supposed to be judging. And we see from what Jesus is saying that he is making it a clear statement. So we need to understand, okay, what, what does this text mean? What does the rest of the New Testament say about judgment, and how does that fit in our lives of transformation? What should we do about it? There are many other portions of Scripture that call us to exercise judgment. So Jesus is not saying here in verse 1 that the Christian, the true authentic follower of his, is never to cast judgment. That's not what he's saying. 
That's not what he's saying. And we know this to be true because the rest of the New Testament is marked by examples and teachings of when we are called to exercise judgment. Let me give you a few examples. First of all, just look in the bottom of our text, verse 6. Jesus, right here, after he says not to judge, then says, Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs. That requires some judgment, doesn't it? We must have some formulated judgment to discern and, and practice that passage right there. In the, further on in this gospel, in chapter 18, Matthew records Jesus' teaching for the church, laying out what it means to exercise discipline in the church. When a brother or sister is in sin, and that sin is personally involved in our lives, we're, we are called as loving friends to go and bring judgment for our brother and sister through humble church discipline as a means of grace in our lives. Paul, we have recorded for us in Galatians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul confronts the Apostle Peter, who's in the wrong, humbly bringing judgment to a brother to point out where he is not walking in gospel ethics. In John's gospel, chapter 7, the Lord Jesus says this, do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. So we have for us this verse here that we're studying this morning, and then the myriad of other texts throughout the New Testament that call us to judge rightly. So there are points in our transformed Christian lives where we are called to bring judgment and where we are to heed verse 1, judge not. And so I just want to spend our time this morning asking this question. How do we know when judgment is righteous or when it is unrighteous? What kinds of judgments should we make and which ones should we not make? This is the responsibility of the authentic follower of Jesus. The Bible speaks about discernment, about righteous judgment, and I believe that we need to consider with greater intentionality the pursuit of godly judgment and how that bears fruit in our lives. I think this is our responsibility. This is a burden that the Lord had brought on my own heart personally in my life, and I believe that it is fruitful for the church to consider these things. What does this mean for our lives? Now, to be clear, we are not talking about judgment that the Bible makes about what is clearly right and wrong. The Bible is clear when it comes to moral judgment about what is right and what is wrong. There are principles put forth that shape a biblical worldview that help us identify ungodly ideologies. There are ungodly ideas in our world, in our culture, in systems, in places. And the Bible is real clear about things that are right and wrong. We should judge things with the same clarity that God's Word gives us, that the Bible informs for us about right and wrong. But the judgment that Jesus is addressing in our text is not that kind of judgment. What Jesus is talking about here in our text is the critical, self-righteous, pride-fueled judgment of other individuals. He is talking about those critical attitudes and thoughts and judgments that are welled up in our own pride that we cast on other individuals. And I think it's absolutely critical for us to identify those in our own lives and consider Jesus' teaching and figure how to work those things out. And here's why it's so important, I believe. I think we fail to realize how damaging these critical judgments of others, 
how damaging they are for our own souls. I, th- I think we can clearly see it's, it's easy to understand, okay, judging others is not good when we bring that judgment out when we share it with others, when we bring it upon others, and it's not helpful. We can see that out there. But I think what the Lord put on my heart through this text was we fail to realize how those critical judgments damage our own hearts over time, how they, they build up, how, how it hinders our ability to understand God's grace in our lives, how, how it, it it can harden our hearts so that we, we see faults in others and we fail to see the faults in our own lives. And, and it, it weakens our ability to extend grace to others. It damages our hearts. Listen to uh, the words of Charles Spurgeon, the famous preacher, speaking of, of this text in this way. He says this, It does us much hurt to judge our neighbors because it flatters our conceit. And our pride grows quite fast enough without feeding it. Listen to this. We accuse others to excuse ourselves. Do you see what happens there? Even even when judgment of others is not expressed, even when it's held in, it does this in our own hearts. We, we, we cast accusations, and that, that allows us to make excuses. We flatter our conceit. So, in studying this text, I, I want to, to give us, I feel like this will equip us, it is, it is serving my own soul as I seek to work this out in my life. Here are six filters, or, or six marks, six things in which we should take judgment when it rises, and push them through these filters to discern, is this righteous or unrighteous judgment? Okay? Six filters for us. The first one, they might be up on the screen. Yes, the guys are on it. The first one, judgment, it should not be habitual, but only as needed. Our judgment should not be habitual, but only as needed. We are not, the Christian is not to be people who are habitually looking to pass judgments on others, on their words, on their actions, on the practices that they do. We should not have an eye out for everything and anything in order to pass a critical judgment upon others. This not only leads to a habit of harsh judgment, uh, but it causes it to surface unnecessarily. Here's where I've discovered this in my own life in a particular way, and I'm not proud to say it, but it's, it's true and honest. I have found, as I've studied my own soul in this area, that, that I have this, this, this pattern of this habit of judgment, this, this critical eye when it comes to certain individuals. You ever have that? Okay. You're tracking with me, good. Where I can just begin to develop this, this, this critical eye for every little thing that they do or say. This person just, they just tend to rub me the wrong way. And so whenever I'm around them, any, it's just anything that they say or do. I mean, how they walk, like that's silly. <laughs> but because of that that pattern and that habit of just fault finding on everything, it, it builds in our soul. Like Spurgeon was saying, right? It, it, it's flattering some conceit in there and it finds a way to stack itself up. And I have this, this pattern. And if, if we are not careful to identify that, to examine that in our own hearts and in our minds, those patterns will build and we will find a habit of critical judgment of others. And it's not necessary. It's not righteous because it's not needed. So that's how we know. We push it through that filter. Is this needed? So how do we know when judgment is needed? Well, we have a help. Okay, 
This book, our Bible, helps us to understand when judgment is necessary. And if you study your New Testament and find all the places where it's teaching about judgment or giving examples about judgment, you will find that necessary judgment is connected in meaningful relationships. Necessary judgment is connected where there is meaningful relationship. We see those when they are caught in sin that brothers and sisters in meaningful relationship go to them out of love for them. This means that judgment of others that is condemning and critical is not needed when there is no relationship. How often have I found myself with critical judgment of somebody that I have no relationship with? I don't know them. They don't know me. But man, it's easy. It's easy for unrighteous judgment to well up. Listen to how, what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Thessalonians, uh, this is chapter 4, verse 11. He's talking to the church, and he says this, You are to aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs, to work with your hands as we have instructed. So listen, the Apostle Paul writes to the church in Thessalonica, and he tells the church that their aspiration, here's what you are to aspire to, mind your own business. That's what he says. Mind your own business. How many of us, how many of us, I know for myself, would experience a decrease in judgments passed on others if we filtered those through is this really any of my business? Is this really any of my business? Do I have a personal, a connected relationship with this person that it should be my business? I believe we would find a decrease in unrighteous judgment in our hearts and in our lives with that filter. Okay, filter number two. Our judgment is not to be inconsistent but with humble self-assessment. This is what Jesus is talking about with this word picture, this parable that he gives, right? Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? He's calling us to be consistent with judgment for others. What does it mean for us to remove the log from our eye in order to eat? pick up these words here, that Jesus says, in order to see clearly to bring judgment to a brother. In order to see clearly, it requires of us a humble honesty about our own faults. A, a self-assessment to examine our own hearts. This, this judgment of others that can be wrong and hypocritical is a means of overlooking our own Faults, right? That's the word picture. You're not looking at the log in your eye because all you see is the speck in your brother's eye. You're quick to pass over your own faults. Paul addresses the church in Rome in Rome, Romans chapter 2, verses 1 and 2 this way. He says, Therefore, you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges, for in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, practice the very same things. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Paul is saying, listen, you have no business judging others about the same things that you do. Unless you're willing to humbly assess your own heart. Here's, here's a helpful Here's a helpful understanding of this principle. If we are not so burdened by our own sin, we have no business burdening ourselves with other sins. If we're not so burdened by our own sin, and we should be, then we have no business burdening ourselves with the sins of others. 
Now, I am not saying that we have to be perfect or that we will never be in a position to call out our friend on their wrongdoing. That's not what this is about, right? We know this side of the glory of heaven and the return of Jesus, none of us will get to that spot. We're always in transforming state. We're always a work in progress, right? So it doesn't mean we have to be perfect and we can't have any sin in our life if we're going to call out a brother or a sister. But it does mean that we have to have an honest assessment of our own hearts when we consider the wrongdoings of others. Okay? When we see the speck in others, our first reaction in that is to go, okay, where am I tripping up in a similar way? Examining our own hearts and asking the Lord for grace to bring righteous judgment out of love. I, I'm learning this particular principle. Uh, I'm learning how it is, it's more and more crucial in parenting than I ever realized. Uh, when, it, when it comes to parenting, there... I, I do believe that there is definitely the truth uh, that children learn much more what is caught than what is taught. Um, how often I have lectured my children uh, for minutes at length, because I think that what, what they really need is a sermon, only to have them observe 30 seconds of my behavior and undo anything that I said at length. I want my kids, I desperately want my kids to know intimately what forgiveness is, what grace is. And so I have found the most meaningful times of conversation and fruit with my children, they have come when I have gone to them to say I was wrong, to say sorry, to say dad was not living the way that I want to live, the way that the Lord wants me to live. Would you forgive me? Those moments of humble self-assessment have brought fruitful conversations. Filter number three for understanding righteous and unrighteous judgment. Judgment must not be presumptuous, but it must be filled with charity. We must not put ourselves in the position to impute the motives uh, to words and actions of others, right? We do not know the hearts of other people. We don't know their hearts intimately. And so we must be careful not to put ourselves in the position of imputing motives I know why they did this and said this. We are to embrace, instead, a kind and generous interpretation of the actions of others. We should be careful not to bring concluding judgments without complete knowledge. How many times have you uh, observed a circumstance, a situation, a reaction of somebody... And that brought some judgment to mind of that individual. And then just for you later on uh, in the process to get more information about the situation and realize, oh, oh, I was I was totally wrong in how I judged that in that assessment. I, I didn't have all the information. I just didn't know all that was going on there, all the details. And you look back and you're like, I was, I was pretty quick to cast a judgment there. That's, that's putting ourselves in the position of being presumptuous of a circumstance, of a situation. Uh, the book of Proverbs says this in, in chapter 18, verse 13. If one gives an answer before he hears, it is his folly and shame. We want to be charitable in our judgments, and often that requires a, a, a waiting. Right? which Tim loves to do. A waiting, a patience with others, with the same sort of patience that we would deserve from them. We make judgments too quickly. John seven fifty one, 
Jesus says this, does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? Be careful to cast judgment without understanding the full scope of the situation. We can so easily see the wrong behaviors of others. We know nothing of the temptations or the struggles which they have. We can, uh, we can hear about the circumstances and situations of others, the mess that they might be in, and formulate a judgment and know nothing of the temptations that they have faced, of the struggles that they have gone through that has put them in that situation without any compassion or charity towards them. Charitable charitable judgment, it calls calls us to give others the benefit of the doubt. Uh, One pastor and author, Tim Shorey, says it this way. Since God alone knows the thoughts and intentions of the heart, he alone can judge what people are really thinking and why they are really doing the things they do. It is not our prerogative to judge people's motives and actions badly. Instead, we are to judge others charitably. Charitable judgment is the position of the authentic follower of Jesus. Now, a bit of a side note here. I I think it is helpful, considering this, this filter, that we should... We should do an assessment and be aware of how much uncharitable judgment we are consuming. Uh, We consume the uncharitable judgment of others way more than I think we realize. When the TV's on, the radio's on, the conversation in the culture, it is dominated by uncharitable judgment of others. That's what we, we hear from news channels and political ads and conversations in the culture. There can be opinions, there can be positions, but what is so dominant and prevalent is really just uncharitable judgment. Just casting these things. And, and I think if we don't, if we don't have an awareness and an eye out for this, we cannot realize how much of that we are actually taking in and consuming and how that has a dulling effect on our hearts. These, these things can dull the discernment in our hearts and, and we begin to consume and, and we can, we can think of those things, well, well, the position that they're talking about, I, I kind of agree with, right? What they're arguing for is, is what I would argue for, and, and I agree with their conclusions. And so we, we, we kind of take those things, and then we excuse the fact that, yeah, they're not really being charitable in the judgment of the other person on the other side, but, but I agree with what they're saying and what they're arguing. And we just pass over the fact that they are harshly judging another individual, and missing that that is is a preeminent reality in the eyes of the Lord. To be careful of those things, because that will damage our souls. I have deleted podcasts that I was listening to because I agreed with the positions being argued, but when God took this and pressed it on my heart, I thought, Yeah, I'm getting some of the position, but I'm getting a whole lot of unrighteous judgment into my ears, and it's dulling my soul to understand grace to me that should come through me. And I don't want that to be. The principle of charitable judgment, it calls us to think the best of others. It doesn't mean to be naive. Right? We're not saying that. The Bible is clear. Moral judgments, right and wrong. So we are not to be naive people, but we should have a category of the best intentions and to generously open that up to others. We can judge ideologies. We can judge positions without uncharitably judging others. 
Filter number four. We are not to cast judgment with eager delight, but with sober sorrow. In 1 Corinthians, Paul is talking about love. And he's saying it does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but it rejoices with truth. Right? The heart of love is misplaced when there is even the simplest pleasure at finding the faults and failings of others. Maybe that's not you. Maybe that's just me. But I have had times in my life where I have observed the faults of others and it was a little bit pleasing to me. I took a little bit of joy in seeing the failures of others. And I believe that is because when we can see the sins of others and we can mark and highlight the sins of others, it's much more easy to hide our sins behind the curtain. Look over there, not over here. Look what they did. Look how they live. Look what they said. We find a little bit of joy in the faults of others because it hides our own Since this is why the Bible talks in many places about how dangerous gossip is. Why is gossip so appealing? It's it's hard to turn away from, isn't it? When when you hear it rising over here, it's it's hard not to lean into that, isn't it? What's going on there? Why do we lean into that? Listen, listen to what Proverbs, Proverbs talks about it in chapter 18, verse 8. The words of a whisperer, gossip, they're like delicious morsels. And they go down into the inner parts of the body. We, we lean in to gossip because they're these delicious morsels. They, here's what they do. They satisfy the appetite of our own pride. They, they perpetuate the lie that our sinful nature craves. Here's the lie. At least I'm not as bad as them. <laughs> right? Look what they did. Look what they... I, I would never do that. Oh, how careful we need to be with that word never. Because here's the reality. But for the grace of God, there go I. <laughs> when I see... The sins of others, I should not have a bit of delight in the downfall of others. I should not fall to the temptation to swallow the morsels of gossip. That is only being blind to my own sin and the damage that it's done to my own souls. How my pride craves those things. When I see the sins of others, I should be sorrowful. Sober sorrowful because what is sin? Sin is this rebellion and separation from God. And where I witness any sin, I see an individual who's in trouble, in need of help. What they're doing, thinking and saying is causing separation from the object of joy. And so it should break my heart not cause me to stir with joy and delight. The sins of others should be heartbreaking for us. That will lead us to righteous judgment. This sober sorrow over sin will call us to go to them out of love and restoration. Filter number five. Our sin, our judgment must not be trivial, but biblically relevant. It must not be irrelevant, but it must be of first importance. We should not judge people because of minor issues, right? Jesus taught us not to judge by appearances. We should be careful not to judge others because of the movies they watch, the food that they eat, the habits that they have, the practices they let their kids engage in, etc., etc., right? All these surface issues that we love to cast judgments on so quickly, they're trivial things. Our homes, 
can easily become atmospheres of trivial judgment. We can be critical of others in trivial matters. There is this nitpicking that can just well up and we think it's not such a big deal, but we just find ways to judge others just because they don't load the dishwasher the same way that I load the dishwasher. Or they don't fold the sheet. I can never fold a fitted sheet. Anyway. But those, those things, man, don't they come up so easy? Those quick thoughts of just, of, ju it's, of, of just finding an action. And then we find it's not just the action, but the, the person that our judgment so easily comes upon. And they're trivial things. They're things that don't really matter. And over time, they well up and pile on our hearts so we get into these habits of unrighteous judgment. I referenced earlier when the Apostle Paul goes to confront the Apostle Peter about his sin. Listen to what he says in Galatians 2, verse 14. He says, when I saw that their conduct, listen to this phrase, was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I went to them in their sin. That's the filter he uses for, for being biblically relevant. It was not in step with the truth of the gospel. That's the filter that we should pass on any judgment through. Is what I'm tempted to judge this individual for, is it not in step with the truth of the gospel? Or is it just a trivial thing? Most often, it can be just a trivial thing. Sixth, final filter. Our right judgment, it must not be destructive, but constructive. We must consider, what is the aim of righteous judgment? When the New Testament talks about calling us to judge others rightly, what's the aim for that judgment? Is our aim of that judgment to uphold truth for the sake of building up or... Are we just throwing words of judgment just to tear others down? Do we say things out of anger, frustration, jealousy, just to highlight the faults of others in order to tear others down? Galatians 6, 1 and 2 says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Righteous judgment is constructive. It wants to bear the burdens of others in order to restore them. Remember what we said, sin is rebellion and separation from God. And so righteous judgment seeks to restore where sin is breaking relationship with the Lord. We don't want to tear others down. We want to build them up. So these six filters help us to process judgment in order to decide, is it righteous or unrighteous? And now, just in closing, a few ways, how do we grow in righteous judgment? We have these filters. How do we then apply these things? What should we do about this? When you leave here, take the word of God seriously. I want to be applying this to my life. How do we do that? The first we must be prayerfully repentant. We have to use these filters, identify in our lives where there is unrighteous judgment, and then be prayerfully repentant. Listen, repentance is not an idea, it's an action. It's not just an idea, it's an action. We must be willing to take any of our thoughts of unrighteous judgment to the Lord, asking that the Spirit would purge our hearts of this kind of judgment. And it's not only it's not only when we act on unrighteous judgment. It's not only when we judge others with critical judgment and then we we say it to them or we gossip to others. That's not the only time for repentance. Even when it comes up in our own hearts and minds and never comes out of our mouths. Should we be prayerfully repentant? When that person, when you're driving, intentionally cuts you off because they hate you, 
There's no other reason why they would pull out in front of you like that, causing you to move your foot four inches over from one pedal to the other. It must be because they hate you and want to ruin your day. That's the only reason why they would do that. And therefore, your heart and mind cast some sort of judgment, even in the quiet of your own car. You say whatever you say in that moment. Nobody else hears it but you. You know what that is? An opportunity. An opportunity to bring that to God and say, Oh, Lord, that was in my heart. And it just came out. The critical judgment. Would you cleanse me of that? Would you help me to judge rightly and not just throw out those words? because of the damage that it does to our own souls. So be prayerfully repentant. Another tip, spend time in the school of righteousness. Here's your curriculum. The Spirit is your teacher. Jesus is your example. Study this book to see what righteous judgment looks like. What does it look like? How can I be influenced by the Word of God? Instead of influenced by the ethics that are outside, right? The ethics of our culture. We don't want to be people of our culture. We want to be people that follow Jesus Christ. People that are informed by this truth, by this book, and not by the narratives out there that are so filled with critical judgment. Let the Spirit take God's Word and make it work in our lives. And finally, maybe most importantly, How do we grow in righteous judgment? We consider again and again the judgment that Jesus received in our place. We look again to the cross. Every one of us deserving the righteous judgment of God for our sin that brings wrath and judgment upon our sin that Jesus, the Son of God, would take our place receiving that judgment for us so that we, the Christian, are no longer condemned. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Jesus, the Son of God, has received the judgment that we deserve. What do we get? Wells of grace. Grace upon grace, overflowing in our lives. So how do we grow in righteous judgment? We think again of the judgment Jesus received. We rehearse the gospel again and again. It fills us with an understanding of what amazing grace is. And when we look again and again at that Savior in our place, it will fill us with that grace in order to extend that to others. And we find our lives transformed by the gospel, not at a moment of conversion, but at every day in our Christian lives. The gospel does work every day because it frees us from sinful patterns of unrighteous judgment, letting us be ambassadors of grace for the glory of God. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth of this teaching, for your word. I recognize and and am well aware that this brings conviction to heart and mind. And I pray, Lord, that that conviction would not be a discouragement for us, uh, but it would be a means of grace, that your spirit would use that to teach us, to change us, to transform us that we would see these things in our own souls and that you would, by your Spirit, purge them from our hearts, that we would live rightly before you because in obedient living we find great joy growing closer and closer to you. Would you bless these saints with your word and the work of your Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you all stand for our last hymn? All of creation 
all of the earth Make straight a highway path for the Lord Jesus is coming soon Call back the sinners Wake up the saints Let every nation shout of your fame Jesus is coming Thank you for our teaching today. May we be challenged, Lord. May we be people of action as we fall to our knees. Father, so much of um, this topic of judgment is in our lives. And, and we ask, Lord, uh, each, each of us, starting with me, that, Father, we would rehearse the gospel through uh, every, everything we see and we hear. And, um, what you put on our hearts, Lord, with each individual we come up uh, in our lives. Father, may we be beacons of light, of, of just grace, of forgiveness, and, and judgment, Lord, when we need. Um, Father, that we would follow the moving of the Spirit, but may we be on our knees first and in your word. We love you. Thank you for today. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Thanks for worshiping with us. Have a blessed week.